And we're back once again. It's the Horror Guys with episode 165. I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. And we've got horror movies again for you, believe it or not. We're going to talk about some horror movies. We are. We got some good ones. We got some stinkers. Do we get any stinkers this week? Well, we got some okay ones. I don't think we had any that really stinks. Okay, I'll go with that. Yeah, some some okay. Yeah, what do we got? Well, we got Let's Scare Jessica to Death. An oldie. A fun game from 1971. And we have a newer one called, well, relatively new, from 2017, Pie Whack It, which is just fun to say. Pie Whack It. Pie Whack It. Pie Whack It. Yeah. If you say it seven times in the mirror, you know, the Pie Whack It will appear. Don't do that. Okay. Yeah. We got another oldie, The Blood on Satan's Claw, also from 1971. And we have a short we're going to talk about. And uh, oh, 1971 seems to be the year. Totally yeah. coincidence. I mean, sometimes we do theme weeks. This is just luck. Three out of four of them are the same <laughs> year. And this one is Wake in Fright, which is debatable if it's a horror. Some people call it a horror, but it's really more of a thriller and a you know kind of a you know, human story. Kind I think of the a, guy is in a scary situation. Oh, it's it, yeah. There's some scary lost in Australia with in no it. money and. Surrounded by crazy people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and those are the ones we're going to talk about this week, of course. And those uh, the, the, the written reviews on all of those wind up on HorrorGuys.com. And if you go to HorrorBulletin.com, the companion site for our newsletter, you get all of those in your email every Saturday. Plus, there's another email with bonus reviews that you won't hear about here. We've got some good ones this week. We've got... Assignment Terror from 1970. Sort of an alien invasion, but they do it by resurrecting Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Wolfman. It's a weird one. It's like the the aliens using our own monsters monsters against against us. us. Yes. (laughs) And then 1965's Ed Wood classic. I don't know if classic is the right word. I think classic is the right word. Orgy of the Dead, a Thinly disguised porn movie, if I had to call it something. Yeah. Um, Softcore? <laughs> yeah, it's Well, just I mean, it wouldn't yeah. certainly wouldn't be called porn today, but in 65, Softcore. I'm yeah, sure it probably cer- was. Yeah, yeah. Titillating, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> There's a lot of breasts in that one. A lot of topless dancers. There's more breasts of, than there is story. Yeah, yeah, there is. It's a weird one. Yeah, it's very... But anyway, you can read that review and the one on the uh, Assignment Terror at HorrorBulletin.com. You don't have to sign up for the newsletter. You can read them right there on the site. But, of course, it's if you sign up, you get them every week. And we like you when you sign up. And it's free, so we, hey, why not? We like you extra much. Yeah. We like you anyway for just for listening. But we really like you if you subscribe. Do we though? We yeah. make make our listeners we subject our listeners to, you know, spoilers every week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes we do. All right. Well let's let's scare our listeners to death. Okay. Or maybe Jessica. maybe we should start with Jessica. Just just Jessica first. Want me to do the spoiler free first? Sure. It's short. Uh, it's a slow build that really gets interesting as it goes along, which I, I think is completely true. Yeah. 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 Uh, something seems to be out to get Jessica. Or is it? It's a movie that lets the audience kind of come to their own conclusion. They don't spell it out what ex- what is exactly happening. They do not. Yeah. Directed by John Hancock. I wonder if that's his real name. Boy. <laughs> Written by John Hancock, <laughs> Lee Calcham, and Sheridan LeFanu. Stars Zora Lampert, Barton Heyman, Kevin O'Connor, Hour and 29 Minutes. So, what did you think? Did you like it? Yeah, I did overall. It wasn't what I expected. I somehow I had never seen this over the years. I saw it I when it came it. out, or thereabouts when it was on TV after it came out, probably in the seventy three or seventy four range. Okay, and I'd completely forgotten about it. Yeah, this was my first time on it. All right. Well, we start with a man loading a coffin into a hearse. And credits roll. And already, it's not what you think. It's not. No. Yeah, this is just their their private vehicle, and they're just having a hoot, and uh, Jessica's riding in the coffin. <laughs> just for just for laughs. Nineteen seventies <laughs> goth people. Mm-hmm. Woody Duncan and Jessica get out of the hearse. For the first time in months, I'm free. Forget the doctors, Jessica narrates. Duncan says the farm will be good for her after what she's been through. She then does a rubbing of a headstone and sees a strange woman who isn't there after she looks away. Have you ever noticed that how much that happens in movies? Mm-hmm. They look at somebody and there they are. They turn away for half a second and then they're gone. And then they're gone. That ever happened to you in real life? It never has in real life. 
Not unless you're looking at Batman. Well, he does that all the time. Yeah. 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 Don't tell them. Act normal, she tells herself. What? Is she faking sanity? Hmm. Hmm. There's a lot of voiceover in this. You hear they, her inner monologue. Yeah. They take a ferry across a cove. The locals call them damned hippies for driving around in a hearse. And finally, they arrive at a big old house on a farm. Jessica, why have you come here? Says the voice in the fog. There's someone in the house, and all three of them go upstairs looking for the intruder. Turns out it's a girl who named a girl named Emily who thought the place was abandoned. Or that's the story. See, this movie is just full of stuff like that. You think, oh, the house is haunted already. There, there's a ghost. And no, it's just a person. Just a squatter. Oh. <laughs> Jessica invites her to stay and spend the night, and then they'll drive her to town in the morning. Emily pulls out her lute and starts to play during dinner. I guess that's a hippie thing. you got to always pull out your stringed instrument and go. Mm-hmm. And it's not a guitar. It's a lute. No. One of the melon-shaped things. Duncan accompanies her on his cello. Different kind of stringed thing. Oh, he's a professional musician. Yes, he is. Uh Yeah, he's got an excuse. She's just a hipster. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty good, though. The voice... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The voices in Jessica's head continue, and we soon get the impression that Jessica's not completely sane. Actually, we find out she was just released from an institution, and this trip to the country is to help her recover. Emily suggests that they have a seance. Jessica hears more voices and gets upset. Is it ghosts? No one else hears anything. Just Jessica. Later, Duncan and Jessica have sex while Woody and Emily get together downstairs. The next day, they all go wash in the lake because there, I guess there's no running water in the farmhouse. It must not have been. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not just swimming for fun. It's more of a bathing kind of thing. and mm-hmm. That just seems weird. They don't have a bathroom. They have fun doing it, though, too. Well, yeah. yeah. Jessica might be a little jealous of Emily, who has decided to stay with them. Jessica swims out into the lake and sees something scary down there that calls to her, and she freaks out. Later, Jessica worries that Duncan thinks she's losing her mind again. And at this point, he'd have every right to think that. Yeah, and we're starting to wonder. They spend the day searching the farm for things they might want to sell. Jessica and Duncan decide to invite Emily to stay with them for as long as she likes, which pleases both Woody and Emily immensely. Jessica buys some eggs while Duncan deals with an old man who hates hippies. This town isn't very friendly to young people or strangers, and Jessica notices that the old men all have some sort of bandage on. Every one of them has some kind of little scar on their neck. Just weirdness, yeah. They drive on and meet Sam, who owns an antique store. When Sam finds out they bought the old bishop place, he tells them some of the stories about the people who died there. He does still offer them money for some of the antiques and an old photo. Abigail Bishop drowned there in the 1800s, and people say her ghost still roams the hills there. Some even say she's a vampire. They never found her body. Jessica sees Abigail in the cemetery soon after, and Jessica chases her to the lake where she finds Sam, the antique dealer's bloody body. When she brings Duncan back to see, there's no sign of anything. So did she imagine it, or are they faking it and setting her up and, you know, playing with her mind. She swears she didn't imagine it this time. They catch up to the girl, who is real, but she can't speak. Dinner that night is awkward as Jessica argues with herself inside her own mind. She goes upstairs and plays with her pet mole. Who has a pet mole? Well, she doesn't because it's not really a mole. (laughs) That was some weirdness of, yeah. She keeps talking about the mole and her pet mole, and we look at it, and it's a mouse. It's a mouse. It's a mouse. Yeah, that was so weird that they didn't just change the script. I mean, I understand the difficulty of getting a mole, probably. Why not just have it? She found it out in the field. Why not just call it a mouse and yeah, be done with not? it? Yeah, that would have been so simple. Well, Duncan suggests that maybe they could go back to New York for a while so she can see her doctor. Yes, he does think she's having mental issues. They argue, and she goes downstairs, and later the mute girl sneaks in and seduces Duncan. The next morning, Jessica finds her pet mole mutilated and dead. Jessica knows she didn't do it. She's adamant that she's not crazy, but she she sure looks like it. She thinks she didn't do it anyway. Jessica sees the painting they sold hanging up in their attic and hears a voice saying, I'm still alive. The picture of Abigail looks very much like Emily. Emily wants to go swimming again, but Jessica's a little afraid after what happened the other time. Emily pushes Jessica in, and Jessica isn't happy. Jessica sees a body under the water again, and it says, 
Come this way. Follow me. A hand reaches up and grabs her. She gets away, but the dead woman climbs up out of the water and follows her this time. Yikes. The dead woman tries to bite her in the neck, but Jessica breaks free and runs back to the house. The voices start telling her, you want to die. I won't go away. You'll never get rid of me. She runs to the woods and heads to town. Once again, she sees that all the men have weird scars, so she runs back into the woods until she finds Duncan. Woody comes inside and asks Emily where Jessica is, and Emily is very weird about it. He thinks she's been up to no good, but she starts acting all slutty and he falls for it. Duncan and Jessica return home and find there's no power, so they light a lamp. They start making out, and then she notices that Duncan has one of those scars on his neck as well. He's in on it. She watches the ghost approach both of them with a knife. Jessica wakes up and finds all the townspeople in her bedroom, wandering around like zombies. She runs outside and looks for Woody's tractor, but finds Woody dead. She continues running through the woods to the ferry, but the ferryman, who also has a scar, says, The ferry isn't running for you. He says it just like that, Just like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the Grand Nagus. (laughs) Jessica then steals a rowboat and tries to head to the mainland on her own. Out in the middle of the lake, she watches a hand reach up out onto the boat. Then she hacks the attacker to pieces with a boat hook. Oops, it's actually Duncan. Oopsie. She watches as Emily and the locals walk back into the woods, and Jessica's no longer sure what's real. And for that matter, neither are we. Yeah, it was interesting how that was done. Yeah. Yeah. Duncan was just out swimming and going to get in her boat, and or was he? Or was he? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you just don't, yeah, you really don't know. Was it a conspiracy or was she crazy? Or was it a mixture? A little of both. Yeah. Duncan looks like a balding middle-aged guy in his late 30s or even 40s, not what you'd call your stereotypical hippie. I can't imagine why the locals treated him the way they did. You think it's one of those things like he was supposed to be like a teenager or something? You know how they do in horror movies so much. I wonder. He looked awfully they, old to be a teenager or they were a, sure, a hippie hippie. They were sure acting like he was a young, freaky hippie. And like, no, it's just a guy. I, you know, nothing. <laughs> I mean, he was a stranger in town. And, well, you know, there's they, that, yeah. They don't like strangers, I suppose. But yeah, it was, they were acting awfully odd toward him. Yeah, Woody has the stereotypical hippie look. Mm-hmm. But he didn't have much interactions with the locals that we saw. Yeah, Duncan looks like, you know, a, you know, a high school history teacher or something. He's just yeah, a, a not, normal guy. Uh-huh. And the mole, of course, looks suspiciously like a mouse. Did the filmmakers really think people couldn't tell the difference? It all starts out pretty slow, but the suspense and paranoia build up more and more as it goes on. Is there a ghost? Is Jessica crazy? Is Emily trying to trick her? Or is it all of the above? Hmm... You'll have to decide yourself. Yeah. The title of the film indicates a conspiracy to drive Jessica insane, but other than either Emily or maybe a real ghost that looks like her, we don't really get that. I was still expecting right up to the end that Woody Duncan and the other dead people would sit up and give a sort of gotcha moment, but they don't. The ending is very vague. Still, still, I suspect the trick is on us. We're supposed to think it's a conspiracy, but Jessica really is insane. It's a neat twist on the usual conspiracy film. Yeah, I agree. I, overall, I liked it, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I looked up John D. Han- Hancock. That's a real guy. That's his real name. But, you know, good luck in doing <laughs> some people. Put your put John, you John, put Hancock, your John Han- Hancock here. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, and, and supposedly they, you know, it was written that it was supposed to be a mole and they couldn't find a mole and there, here's a mouse. Well, why not just change the the lines? They may have recorded it. They may have done the whole scene with the mole talk and all that, and then they cut in the visual of the animal later. Yeah, maybe. And, you know, we we did a mole, and we can't find a mole. Yeah. Would be my guess. Yeah. (sighs) They didn't try real hard. No. No, I don't think they did. (laughs) All right. Well, then that takes us up from 1971 up to 2017, where we saw one called Pie Wacket. Uh, directed and written by Adam McDonald, stars Lori Holden, Nicole Munoz, and Chloe Rose, hour and a half trailer in the show notes. And the, looking at the movie poster here, it says, Fantastically creepy, lands with a punch to the gut. I didn't he, feel a punch to the gut, but I thought it was pretty creepy. Yeah, it was good. Okay. Yeah. Spoiler free. Spoiler free. Is it witchery or madness? Or maybe a little of both. 
This movie will have you wondering. Sounds like the last one. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Set in a parallel reality where people are forced to attend high school into their 20s. Oh, my. Uh, yeah. The angst is understandably palpable. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I tend to diss on that. Constantly. I, o- overall, it was an enjoyable movie, an entertaining movie, but my gosh, these teenagers were, you know. 30? Yeah, so obviously not <laughs> teenagers. Not 30, but, you know. Uh, it builds on a nice foundation of characters in the first half and then climbs to a heck of an ending. All right. And that's your spoiler for judgment. You liked it? I did, yeah. I was okay with it. I, it no. was not the best thing we saw this month, for no, sure. not the best. It was all right. It was good. It was in the upper percentiles. Okay. Yeah. Leah Rise is a high school student who lives with her mother, who is a depressed alcoholic. Leah's father died some time ago, and her mother is struggling to cope with it. She goes to a book signing and picks up a book on occult rituals. She hangs out with Janice, Eris, Aaron, and Rob, her three best friends. When she gets home, her mother springs on her that she's sold the house and they're moving up north. Leah will leave all her friends behind, and they're all she has. She takes it badly. Her mother shows her the new place, and it's an isolated cabin in the woods. That's a bad start right there. Mm Mm-hmm. In these kind of movies. Her yeah. mother compromises by offering to drive and pick her up from school every day, an hour each way. But her friends do things after school, and she can no longer go along with them. So after school, Leah and her mother do very little but fight and argue. Yeah, and hang out, and looks looks like they're both kind of bored there, too. Yeah. They're bored and angsty and not getting along, and it doesn't seem to be helping Mom a lot yet. No. Not at that point, anyway. Leah goes out in the woods and screams, I wish you were dead. Coming to the conclusion that that isn't going to do anything, she picks up her occult book and decides to do a ritual instead. She goes out to the woods, does the ritual, and then calls upon a demon called Piwacket to manifest himself. When she gets home, her mother apologizes and they make up. It's not like Leah did anything she can't take back, right? Right. Right? Right. (laughs) The next morning, there are dirty footprints inside the back door, but that's all. That night, she hears clomping in the attic. There's nothing up there. Leah starts to regret doing the ritual, even though she hasn't actually seen anything supernatural. That night, we do see the shadow of something roaming through the house. The next morning, Leah wakes up out in the woods, in the place where she did a ritual, with blood all over her hands. She goes to school and tells her friends what she did, and they think she's terrible for doing that, and they think Leah is going to deserve whatever happens. They're surprisingly unsupportive, but Janice offers to spend the night at Leah's house tonight. Janice wants to see the place where the ritual happened, but it's dark out. They use her phone for light and go out into the woods. You know, if I had to go out into the deep, dark woods in the middle of the night where you I'd, couldn't find your way back, I'd want something better I'd want than my phone. more than a phone flashlight, yes. Janice goes into a trance and wanders off into the darkness. She's just messing with Leah, though, and soon the pair go back home to sleep. The next morning, Janice is gone. They find her hiding, hysterical, in the car outside in the morning. And she won't tell what happened. She just wants to leave. Take me home. Take Take me me home. home. No, no, no. (laughs) I don't want to talk about it. (laughs) At school later, Janice isn't there and won't return Leah's texts. Leah decides to contact the author of the occult book and sends him an email. He sends back that he wants to talk to her tomorrow after school. A dark spirit like Piwacket is very manipulative, he explains. He says that with black magic, all the evil will be thrown back at her, unless she does the exact same ritual in the same place, only in reverse. So I guess he didn't just make it all up. He's saying it's real. Yeah. Real magic that he put in the book. She has to do it before it gets to her mother. Leah gathers her materials and goes back out to the woods to start the ritual, but then she finds her mother's dead body out there first. Whoops. Leah calls 911 and runs back to the house. But wait, her mother is there at the house. No, it's Piwacket. Or is it? Piwacket. Who is that? Piwacket killed her mother and took it, took her place. Maybe. Or did it. Or did it. Yeah. Paranoia sets in, and Leah no longer trusts her mother. Is she real, or is it Piwacket? She calls Aaron to come and get her, and oh, oh, yep, it's Piwacket. Leah climbs out the window and runs to hide in the attic as the demon chases after her on all fours. But someone else who looks like her mother comes in. Her mother, or Piwacket, takes the knife away from her and wants an explanation right now. 
Her mother acts like she thinks she's suicidal, hence the knife. Leah goes outside and siphons off a bucket of gas out of the car. She goes into her mother's bedroom and pours it all over her mother. She burns the thing to death. Aaron finally arrives and takes Leah to the hospital, and the police want some answers. No, her mother's body was not out in the woods. And suppose you just tell us how did that fire start? Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. So it leaves you wondering, was she thoroughly, completely tricked? Or was she just nuts and imagined it? Yeah, one of those. One of those things. You really don't know. An occult ritual to spoil your mo- to kill your mother because you're a spoiled brat seems a bit excessive, but at least she was able to follow instructions. That's mo- more than most high schoolers can say. Ooh. Ooh, harsh. The ritual itself takes a good bit of screen time and seems fairly involved. I don't know if it was based on some real ritual or not, but it definitely seemed believably realistic. I think they th- took some elements of pop culture stuff. There's a lot of detail going on there. Yeah, uh-huh. I hesitate to call this another slow burn, but it does spend a lot more time on character development than it does on horror and action. Other than Leah's ritual, not much actually happens in the first hour, but for some reason it never gets boring. No, they managed to pull it off. I, you know, all their performances and the direction and ominous music and you know, just all well done. Uh-huh. Once it gets going, the suspense and uncertainty work real well. Yeah, we both liked it. Yeah, for sure. Hey, how about we watch a short film? Sure, we watched one called The Mirror that's a new one this year. Directed by Nessa Arif. Nessa Arif. uh, Written by Nessa Arif and Allison Hall. Stars Parmas Sahat, Gabriel Lambert, and Maude Green. Runtime is an hour and a half. No, it's not. Hour and a half. (laughs) Where'd I get that from? Eleven and a half. (laughs) These are short film. <laughs> reading, 11 and a half minutes. Reading is hard. Yeah. And you can watch it on YouTube for free. Link in the show notes. Yeah. What happens? Well, Olivia leaves the prom early, and her two friends chase her down the street to see what happened. She says she's just not into the silly old prom. And she seems to have issues. Uh, she wasn't even accepted into community college. So she got no plans, no future. and That a, takes a bit of an effort. Yeah, her friends, you know, are going off, but, you know, she's kind of going to be stuck. Well, her two friends are, you know, they're going to be leaving for university. So Olivia is acting out, and she wants to break into an empty house. Well, you know, they find the key, you know, <laughs> the hidden key in the rock. Yeah. Her friends know better. But they go in, she goes in, they follow her. Inside, she sees a huge old-fashioned mirror. She hides behind the mirror listens to her friends finally come in. And then they all start making themselves at home and having fun. Then weird things happen. (laughs) Yeah. It looks good. It's well acted. Not clear what's happening or why. And the best line, that was so much worse than clowns. Somebody don't like clowns. They're talking about how scary clowns are. And they get a scare and laughing about it. And remember, it always sucks to be Todd. In this case, yeah. That poor guy. (laughs) 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 <laughs> All right, so yeah, we both like that one. The Mirror 2022, link in the show notes to watch it on YouTube. Yeah, you should watch that one. Yeah. All right, and continuing our accidental theme of 1971, we have The Blood on Satan's Claw. Another one of those folk folk horror movies. Uh-huh. Yeah, this was in that uh, that documentary about all the folk horror Woodlands stuff. Dark Woodlands and Dazed Bewitched we reviewed a couple weeks back. Yeah, yeah. they mentioned it heavily. Yeah, this one, uh, well, we'll talk more more later. Directed by Piers Haggard, written by Robert Wynn Simmons and Piers Haggard, stars Patrick Weimart, Linda Hayden, and Barry Andrews. Hour and 37 minutes. All right. And, of course, there is a trailer in the show notes, as always. Spoiler free, this was originally planned to be an anthology of three tales interconnected by all of them having the earthly remains of Satan dug up. Instead, all three were kind of mashed together into one story that's pretty entertaining, but really not great. It's watchable, but a little bit dated and slow today, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. I think it might have been better with three if they had been able to split it up. I thought it was all right. It it was... it was kind I, of I think jumpy. dated is the word I the the big word here. Yeah, and it was kind of jumpy sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like suddenly this was happening, and then you know. Yeah, this one came out, and um, the Conqueror Worm. What was the? Um, yeah, and um, oh, the Wicker Man. Yes, okay. 
the Conqueror Worm, Witchfinder General, the other name for it. Mm-hmm. Those three uh, came out very close together, and they're often you know grouped together as the folk horror uh, folk Renaissance horror trilogy. Yeah, they yeah. came out unrelated entirely. They, I mean, they had nothing to do with each other, but the same era, similar same... topics. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think the Wicker Man, of the three, I like the Wicker Man best. Yeah, me too, for sure. Especially after a recent rewatch. Uh-huh. I might not have said that six months ago. Yeah, seeing the complete version of Wicker Man made all the difference. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, what happens? Well, Raph, Ralph Gower plows his field when a neighbor waves to him. He, f- he finds a weird skull and bones in his field. Credits roll. Ralph grows to, goes to the judge and insists the skull was some kind of fiend, not a human, and not an animal either. Tis a fiend, I tell you. Mm -hmm. It just sounds so good to say it like that. (laughs) Finally talks him into going to investigate further, but it's not there when they return. Reverend Fallowfield is there playing with snakes, but he didn't see anything either. Rosalind comes to stay with her fiancé, Peter, and his hateful aunt. And that's uh, the judge's house. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the aunt makes her sleep in the attic tonight. Well, the judge is staying with them. It's not his house. Yeah, right. He's a he's a house guest. Yeah. yeah. So do you think the aunt and the judge are, you know, very good friends? Yes, I think so, yes. Yes, yes. More than just acquaintances or chums. Yeah. <laughs> Popping back a little bit, Reverend Fallowfield is there playing with snakes. Yeah, that was weird. And the, the way he's shot, it's all creepy because, you know, the preacher's out hiding in the field, playing with these snakes. And if you ever watch Doctor Who... Mm-hmm. He was the, the master for many years. Yeah. Mr. Evil, basically. Uh huh. So you just know he's the bad guy here <laughs> from the very beginning. <laughs> okay, so what happens at the aunt's house? Well, in the middle of the night, Rosalind starts screaming, and the old aunt goes in to beat her up. No, stop that screaming, because that'll help. <laughs> the judge orders that Rosalind's door be nailed shut until the men from the madhouse come to take her away. Aunt Banham gets scratched in the scuffle, gets infected. The doctor decides to bleed a little, bleed her a little to help the recovery, because that's what they did back then. When they take Rosalind away in the morning, Peter notices that she has long claws. Satan's claws? Maybe, yeah. Is there blood on them? No, not yet. Well, well a little bit, the ant. You know, yeah. Scratch the uh-huh. ant, yeah. Well, elsewhere... Because, you know, there's three stories going on at once. <laughs> Angela finds someone, something else in the plowed fields. It's a claw. Satan's, Satan's claw? claw? Yes. The claw and some other trinkets soon wind up in the possession of Reverend Fallowfield. Aunt Banham disappears during the night, and no one has any idea where she's gone off to. That night, Peter goes up to the attic, and something with a large claw tries to pull him down through the floorboards. Was that Satan's claw? I think that was the ant. Oh, okay. I don't know. Yeah. He covers the hole with a large chest, and then goes to sleep in the same room. Yeah, just, you know, a monster tries to yank you through the, through the floor. Just cover up the hole. There's and, a hole in yeah, the floor in go your to bedroom. Sleep. It's you fine. cover it with a chest and just go to bed. Yeah. Yeah, no, nobody does that. <laughs> yeah. Well, during his sleep, he's attacked by the creature. Yeah, surprise. And he stabs it repeatedly. No, that was his own hand. He stabbed himself. Ow. Well, the doctor suggests it's witchcraft going on, but the judge says that's all nonsense. Squire Middleton turn, turn, calls off the search for the ant. The judge goes back to London. Kathy and Mark have been playing with bones in the field, and now Mark starts feeling ill. He and all his friends skip Bible study with Fallow Field, which he doesn't appreciate. Someone strangles Mark while they, all the other kids watch, and later they find him buried in the woodshed. Angel comes to Reverend Fallowfield, tries to seduce him, but he doesn't fall for it. Mark has the devil in him, so we cut it out, she says. What? (laughs) Angel tells her father and the squire that the reverend forcibly raped her. The squire has the reverend arrested for rape and for Mark's murder. Framed. Yeah, but we see the whole scene, mm-hmm. and he did nothing wrong. No, no, he's the he guy didn't. that we suspect all along is going to be the super villain of the movie, and not at all. And he isn't. He was. No, a he red... gets blamed for a rape that he didn't do. He was a red herring. Yeah. Well, out in the field, two local boys find Kathy, and they take her to Angel and the others out in the woods. The whole group does a ritual that summons a monster. Then several of them actually do rape her, while the others watch. Finally, Angel stabs her in the back with garden shears. Yeah, that's a... Oops. Yeah, sacrifice kind of thing. 
Well, Ralph finds Kathy's body, tells the squire what happened, so they release the reverend. They figure out he didn't do it. Peter goes down to London to tell the judge what's been going on in town. The judge has been studying the doctor's book on demonology, and he's much more well-informed than he was the first time around. He's become a believer. Well, the villagers hunt down a stranger and accuse her of being a witch. Ralph arrives just as they throw her into the river to see if she floats. She doesn't. No. She doesn't, but Ralph pulls her out and she survives. They notice that the woman has a furry patch, though, the same as Mark and Kathy had. Ralph calls it the devil's skin. They talk the doctor into trying to cut the patch of skin off. They don't have any painkillers. He does a fair job of removing it, but there's no blood. That That is is probably the best scene of the movie, gore-wise. That was pretty realistic and painful painful to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the woman who got tossed in the lake, uh, she wakes up. She's Margaret, and she does work for Satan. Oops. Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes you're not wrong. (laughs) Sometimes you're not, yeah. (laughs) She's not happy about her skin being removed, but she tries to corrupt... She tries to corrupt Ralph, which doesn't work too well. She soon runs away. The judge arrives. They get him up to speed on the disturbances. The judge takes the skin patch, gets the dogs to hunt down Margaret. Angel, who now has evil eyebrows, runs into Margaret, who was caught in a bear trap. She lets the dogs catch up to Margaret. The judge interrogates Margaret, and she tells the judge where the big party ritual is going to be held tonight. Satan himself will be attending. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Well, out in the field, Ralph finds that he has suspiciously hairy patches on his legs. It's more of Satan's skin. He has been infected. Mm, Yep. That's not good. He sees the judge and a group of villagers heading to where Angel's going to be doing the summoning. Everybody's converging. Ralph wakes up in the middle of the ritual as he and Angel and the other villagers dance around a fire and do ritualistic things. A a naked dancer gives Ralph a knife, but before he can do anything, the judge stabs Angel because he's got God on his side. And the judge just grabs Satan and throws him in the fire. That seemed to be really easy. (laughs) He just picks up (laughs) Satan, throws him over. Yeah, 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 all done. Satan doesn't say (laughs) stop or anything. He's just like, okay. Almost as if it was a puppet. (laughs) (laughs) Most of the characters wear atrocious wigs throughout. Whoever the hair designer was here was awful. It's pretty obvious. The judge is, of course, supposed to be wearing a stylized wig, which was the fashion of the time, but the other's hair is supposed to be real, and it makes some of the actors look like they're doing some sort of silly comedy skit at some times. The soundtrack, you know, like Monty Python, the characters would wear wigs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looked a a lot like that, that. really bad. Yeah. The soundtrack is good, but it is so repetitive that it's going to get stuck in your head insidiously. I can't hear it in my mind now, but it's been more than a week since we watched don't, it. Don't get us started again. All right, well, this one's usually lumped in with, with Witchfinder General and the Wicker Man as the main body of folk horror trend of the early 70s. It's got a really good basic plot, and the acting is all right, but it definitely feels a little dated and pretty slow today. In the end, the judge just picks up Satan and burns him in the fire. Because that's the kind of guy he re- is. That's that's how badass that judge is. (laughs) Satan puts up no fight at all and doesn't say a word. He's pretty tame there. Mm -hmm. Overall, it's pretty entertaining, but a lot of it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Mashed. Mashed. It's a classic. Mashed together three tails. It's a classic. You probably need to see it. Yeah. But it's not terribly great anymore. I'm not... Yeah, I'm I'm no hurry to see it again. But it's certainly watchable and, and should be watched. And then probably the weirdest film this week, Uh another one from 71, Wake in Fright, directed by Ted Kotcheff, written by Evan Jones, Kenneth Cook, and Ted Kotcheff, stars Donald Pleasance, Gary Bond, and Chips Rafferty, hour and 49 minutes, trailer in the show notes, and you just gotta watch that trailer. Mm -hmm. It's like a drinking game. Every time somebody says, take a drink, in the trailer... Well, you'll never make it to the end. <laughs> well, you know, this would be a real challenge if you watched this movie as a drinking game. Every time they drink on screen, you'd take never a drink finish. yourself. You'd never oh finish. Oh, my gosh, they drink so much in this. <laughs> what happens spoiler-free? Well, if you push it, you might be able to call this horror in an existential dread kind of way, with a man trapped in a place he doesn't much like, with a job he's contracted to and can't quit, and with people he generally endures the company of. 
But, and that's all just in the first three minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's really more of just an intense drama and mild thriller. It's mighty good and worth checking out. I don't know. It's, I thought it was very uncomfortable. I'm not sure if horror is the right word. What do you say? Existential dread there. That, yeah. That, that seems real. That seems good. Kind of makes you, it gives you a squirmy feeling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of a lot of lists do consider this a horror film, although it's maybe just on the edge of horror. Yeah, there's no monsters or supernatural or anything. It's just guys. They do go out and shoot a whole bunch of kangaroos, so there's some blood and gore and stuff. Mm-hmm. Some fighting. And it's kind of funny with, with the shooting of the kangaroos. This was intended... Uh, to raise awareness of because there was a lot of kangaroo hunting and killing going on and their population was becoming endangered. Wait, this was a warning against? Uh, they made it look so fun, a, though. Yeah, they did, yeah. I don't think that probably was what they had in mind. But that that was their intention. Well, and there's even a message at the end. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. You know, these were, and they used real hunt real footage. Real yeah. kangaroos there's were real, killed. Real kangaroos yeah. being killed here. But at the time, their, their uh, numbers were not not endangered, but, you know, threatened. And then, uh, you know, 30 or so years later, there were so many kangaroos that they were starting to say, hey, you know, kangaroo meat is delicious. Wouldn't you like some kangaroo steaks? Go harvest some kangaroo and eat them. Wow. <laughs> because they were overpopulated then. Wow. It worked. <laughs> Too well. Yeah. All right. Well, this one happens in Australia, if you hadn't guessed already, but the kangaroos. John Grant dismisses class for the holiday from the tiny one-room school in Taboonda. Taboonda, Taboonda, Taboonda. I could say that all day long. Taboonda. They all seem to vanish into the desert landscape as he hurries home to pack his bags. Yeah, that was so weird. It's just completely flat in all directions. You can tell he's ready to walk out that door when the bell rings. The kids get up. He gets of up. Of course, they're eager. They run. They're free. You know how kids are. But it's a little the room out in the go? desert. Where'd they go? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Poof. You know, even if they had loaded onto a bus, you would still see the bus driving away. You'd think. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing for miles and miles and miles, <laughs> including the kids who just got out. Yeah. Oh, well. Credits roll. He boards the train and goes to Bun- Bundanyaba. The taxi driver says... The Yabba is, I'm not going to do an Australian accent here because I can't do that. (laughs) The Yabba is the best place in the world. Best place in the world. There you go. Yeah. (laughs) He's going to fly to Sydney in the morning and the hotel costs $4 a night. Oh, it must be 1971. (laughs) I like like noticing the prices of things in these old movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this one, it's it's mentioned a lot, the prices of things. Yeah. Well, he stops in the ultra-crowded bar that legally closed two hours ago. Big sign on the window. We close at eight p.m. Yeah, you can even, see the clock. And says even 10. He, and even he goes in, and he's then somebody yells, "Hey, close the door. We're closed. Shut the door. We're closed." Or and something there's like, like a thousand like, people in there. It's just packed. Yeah. <laughs> he then meets Jock Crawford, an old guy who turns out to be the constable of the area and knows the area. He he buys him a beer. John complains that he's essentially held hostage due to his teaching contract, but Crawford doesn't really care. Some drunk sings Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Because it's a Christmas movie. It is. It this is. all takes place at Christmas. It's a Christmas yep. break. Yeah. Uh-huh. But it's Australia, so it's Summer the height, of hot. height yeah. of hot weather. Yeah. And after the Rudolph song is done, two people applaud. <laughs> Everything stops while they do a remembrance ceremony for fallen soldiers. And that's a real thing that they do. Still today? I th- Yeah, somewhat. Less, less than they used to. I assume they're talking World War II or something else? Uh, it can be specific. Vietnam, was that a big it, deal in it, Australia back at this time period? It can be specifically World War II, but it's more of a generic, you know, all our lost soldiers kind okay. of thing. But yeah, it's a VFW sort of thing. Well, it's not, you know, our U.S. is VFW, but... You know, They've got something similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where they will, they will do that, where like everybody, you know, stop and, you know, salute the flag and sing for a minute and remember. And, and they do. Yeah. Well, the two men go out for a steak in a grimy-looking cafeteria. One dollar for a huge steak and eggs. Yum. Can't even get that at Waffle House. <laughs> John watches a bunch of guys gambling on a huge heads or tails game called Two Up. While he's eating, John meets Doc Titan, who seems quieter than most of the other locals. And that's Don, Donald Pleasance. Yeah. In one wacko roll. <laughs> <laughs> he's the best thing about this movie, for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. He's something. Well, Doc's counting the odds on the coin tosses, so John puts on in a big bet and wins a few rounds. After turning $50 into $400, 
remember the steak was a dollar and the hotel was four dollars. So that's a lot of money. Yeah, you bet fifty. Well, it, it keeps doubling every yeah. time. You win out there, then he's a hundred, and then two hundred, and then he suddenly got four hundred. Well, he's pretty pleased with himself, and he says, "Just one more spin, and then he can just quit teaching and leave Tabunda." I guess he put in a thousand dollar deposit that will show that he will finish the year. And if he quits, he loses it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to kind of you have to gradually pay That's that off. A before mighty you can... big deposit of that time period. Mm-hmm. Would you pay huge? A, would you pay fifteen, twenty thousand well, dollars today well, to, to have a job? Well, it's not paid; it's owed. Until he pays that back, he can't quit the job. Ah, and so right. he's gradually, they take some out of every paycheck. And that that's how they guarantee that a teacher out in the boonies like that is going to stay at the post because he's locked into that contract. And they take out, you know, 50 bucks a week or whatever mm-hmm. until that is paid back, probably less than 50 a week, you know, $10 a week. You know? Okay, well, anyway, you know? he loses it all. But if he can buy it out all at once, then he'd be free to quit or do whatever he wanted. Okay. You know? He then cashes out his entire paycheck of $290 every penny he owns, and tries again. And Ooh, it goes poorly. He loses again. Yep. He wakes up the next morning sweaty, naked, and broke. Yeah, he's got literally a dollar left. Yeah. <laughs> he goes to the Department of Labor, but they're closed, probably for the holidays again. He goes in for a final drink, and a man insists on buying him one. Then another. John goes home with old Tim for lunch and meets Tim's daughter, Jeanette, and Dick and Joe come over, and Tim suggests that John hang around. Ah, Nothing for him to worry about. As Tim and his friends talk and drink all day, John gets closer with Jeanette. She seems pretty desperate for sex, and of course he gives in and obliges, doing her a favor. Mm -hmm. He stops in the middle to vomit. (laughs) Well, that's never happened. Well, that's that's romantic. (laughs) Yeah, which she takes a little personally. And when they go back to the house, Doc Titan and a bunch of other guys are all there, drinking heavily, so John joins them. The next afternoon, John laughs that they've all had little episodes with Jeanette. Yeah, apparently oh, she's the tongue. She's pump. not that desperate. She's just yeah, okay. Yeah, she's easy. <laughs> Doc cooks up some kangaroo for John's breakfast. Doc explains that he doesn't really have any money and hasn't any for any more than for five years. It's crazy. You don't need money in the Yaba. Being a doctor, he barters his services instead of charging for them. Yeah, he just barters and scavenges and hunts and, you know, literally has no job, no income. He doesn't even have a doctor's license, but that's okay. Nobody cares. No, they they come to him anyway. He's still got the knowledge and the ability, so, yeah. Well, they go hunting for kangaroo with Dick and Joe, and it's a frantic scene with lots of drunken lunatics driving at high speed through the desert with shotguns. The dog kills one, and they run over another in their car. They stop to have a few dozen drinks, and then they go out to kill gang- kangaroos with a spotlight on their car, which hypnotizes them. Joe fights one per- you know, hand-to-hand fighting with a kangaroo and kills it with his bare hands. Can John do that? He tries, but he doesn't have a good time with it. Later, they get even more drunk, if that's possible, and fight and trash the store and the bar that they're at. John and Doc go home and fight some more, though they start looking mighty friendly as they calm down. Eventually, John wakes up with the worst hangover in recorded history and decides it's time to continue on to Sydney. Yeah, that uh, how he wakes up in the morning, I mean, his hangover is almost palpable through the screen. I don't know how after anybody could even get up drinking, after that. And it's hot and sweaty and, you know, he's dirty and just, uh Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, John takes the gun that Joe and Dick gave him for hunting and heads to town. He eventually runs into Jock Crawford again. And asks, he asks, what went wrong? And Jock helps him get cleaned up, and John continues on his trip through the desert. He trades his rifle to a truck driver for a ride to town, except he didn't specify which town. He didn't go to Sydney. The driver takes him back to Yabba. Uh, but at least he gives him back the gun. Yeah, that was nice of him. He was a decent feller. Out of his mind at this point, John go back to, goes back to Doc's place in order to kill Doc. Who had nothing to do with any of these problems? No, but he's just not thinking clearly at all. He changes his mind and shoots himself just as Doc comes in. Later, John wakes up in the hospital with Jock there, who has a police report explaining the accident. Doc then takes him to the train station and sends him back to Dabunda. I guess somebody, they took a collection up for him or something. Yeah, it was nice of him. And then Charlie asks, did you have a good holiday? And John replies, the best. 
Whoa. <laughs> it's quite a vacation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really doubt this film did too much uh, good for the Australian tourist trade, <laughs> but I could be wrong, like for, for the French movies last week. Mm. <laughs> Apparently, everyone in Australia wants you to drink with them, and they never know when to stop. If poor John had a dollar for every time someone drank in this film, he wouldn't be stuck in the yabba. <laughs> Watching this movie as a drinking game, taking a swallow every time someone in the movie does, you probably wouldn't make it to the end. You would need a high tolerance. Yeah. All the kangaroos we saw being shot were really killed for this. None were special effects. And there were a bunch of them. There's a note at the end explaining that this was done by licensed hunters, but it's still pretty graphic. If this was meant to, it was meant to raise awareness that the population was getting endangered, or at least threatened at that point in time. But, yeah, they sure looked like they were having a lot of fun doing it. Oh, so yeah. I don't know how discouraging that would be. It's really strange watching the usually classy and refined Donald Pleasance doing something this raw. You know, he's always like doctor, psychiatrist, like in Halloween. Well, he's well, a doctor still. He's, he's usually <laughs> a stuck-up kind of guy like on Columbo. I remember when he did a Columbo once and mm-hmm. that was, left an impression. Yeah, a little bit elitist. But here yeah. he is, uh, oh, he's something else here. <laughs> yeah, he is. He alternates between talking about Socrates and being a raving lunatic. Yeah, he's clearly brilliant, you know, intelligent and knowledgeable, but boy, is he whacked too. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if this really qualifies as horror, but it's definitely intense. John makes one wrong decision, and it spirals out of control, and he ends up losing everything financially. But at least, on the bright side, he does make some new friends. He does. Yeah. (laughs) It's one worth watching, for sure. Yeah, Yeah. it's different. Mm -hmm. All right, and that is our show for this week. Tune in next week, where we'll have four more horror films in a short. And we're going to leave that to be a mystery as to what it is. Of course, you can sign up over at HorrorBulletin.com and get them all in your mailbox for free every week. Mm -hmm. And stop in, of course, at horrorguys.com slash books to pick up our books. Yeah, check those those out. we got a whole bunch of those going on. I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. We'll see you next week. You betcha. Yeah. See ya. See ya. See ya.